Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone uh, on this, uh, this wonderful, um, I guess it's an afternoon already, so here, here we go. I'm, uh, I'm Ivo Dollar, the president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Uh, so you know, today's discussion is on the record. We are live streaming. You're welcome to tweet uh, and everything else you want to do in social media, but please do silence your phones while you do that. Um, as you know, uh, perhaps the uh, Chicago Council on Global Affairs is, was founded in 1922 as an independent organization committed to educating the public and encouraging discussions on global issues of the day. Uh, we've done considerable research in a large number of areas, but the one thing we have done longest is public opinion polling uh, of the American public to find their attitudes about, public, uh, about foreign policy. Our first poll was conducted more than 40 years ago in 1974. We conducted them uh, every four years, then every two years, and this is the first time that we have conducted uh, a, an annual poll, which we will do uh, from now on. On your seats, hot off the presses, is our 2015 report uh, on American attitudes towards public opinion. Uh, it offers timely insight into partisan trends uh, as we move into the 2016 election season. Uh, we look at issues like the use of military force, the Iran nuclear agreement, immigration, climate change, and, some, and topics like that uh, to see where the American public stands and where uh, Republican voters, Democratic voters, and independents are on these kinds of issues. Uh, we think the survey offers a guide to the possible future policymakers as they consider where the American public is, as well as to understand how the American public is looking at this in partisan terms. We're delighted uh, to be partnering with Politico in launching uh, this survey this year, and we're especially grateful that Susan Glasser and Michael Crawley uh, are here to join us for, to discuss the results and uh, foreign policy more generally as it pertains to the election campaign. Many of you, uh, I hope, have seen already Michael's excellent story yesterday in Politico uh, about uh, the 2015 poll. If you haven't, please go and read it, but do so after we have our discussion. Our format today is that uh, Dina Smeltz, our uh, foreign policy senior fellow for public opinion and foreign policy at the Chicago Council, who was formerly at the State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research, will give a brief overview of uh, uh, of the findings, and we will then have a discussion moderated by Susan Glasser, who is uh, the uh, uh, editor of Politico and former editor-in-chief of Foreign Policy, uh, joined by Michael Crawley, currently the senior foreign correspondent uh, for Politico, and prior to that, the chief foreign affairs correspondent for Time Magazine. So with that, please uh, join me in welcoming Dina Smeltz. Thanks, Eva. Listening to discussions about foreign policy these days, one can walk away feeling like the world is dangerously unmanageable. The continuing crisis in Syria, the rise of the Islamic State, the related refugee crisis um, that's affecting Europe and Russia's continuing efforts to destabilize Ukraine are repeated headlines and are bound to be featured in tonight's second uh, Republican primary debate. So these data could not come at a better time. I'm going to whiz through a bunch of slides because we want to save most of the time for our discussion. So, um, but we can always follow up later and, and after the event. The, the most important thing here, the dates are May 25th to June 17th, which is before the Iran agreement was finalized. And the main themes um, that we address in the report is that across political party affiliations, Americans support engaging in world affairs and they agree on the top security threats. But beyond this consensus, there are really wide differences on climate change and immigration and there are partisan differences toward a nuclear agreement with Iran, a Palestinian state, and the role of Israel in the Middle East. And one overarching factor in this is that Republicans and Democrats have somewhat different philosophies in how to approach threats to the United States. Republicans tend to emphasize um, forceful approaches, while Democrats tend to emphasize diplomatic approaches. So this is a longstanding question that we ask about the future of the country, taking an active part in world affairs, or if we stay out of world affairs. The purple line is taking an active part, and you can see that two-thirds of Americans support 
the U.S. taking an active role. And this support, we'll just focus over here, this support really is bipartisan, 67% uh, of Dems and 69% of Republicans support taking an active role, and there's been a downward trend over time among independents. Of the top five critical threats, uh, a violent Islamic extremist group terrorist attack in the United States is the top, followed by international terrorism, cyber attacks, the rise of Islamic extremist groups, and the possibility of unfriendly countries becoming nuclear powers. And to that I'd add also a sixth threat, which is Iran's nuclear program, which comes in at 57%. And so these are the same threat. The top four threats are similar across all partisan groups. They're, they may differ a little bit in order, but the main difference is that for Democrats, climate change is the number five top threat. For Republicans, it's number 20, which also means it's at the bottom of the list for Republicans. And um, Republicans have Iran as their fourth top threat. This is a top threat for Democrats, but it comes in more at seven. And then the top three foreign policy goals are also similar across partisan lines, protecting jobs, preventing the spread of nuclear weapons, and combating international terrorism. And again, the differences are in the fourth and fifth place. You can see that Democrats place greater emphasis on securing adequate supplies of energy, improving access to clean water, and Republicans are much more likely to say maintaining superior military power worldwide is a very important goal, and that controlling and reducing illegal immigration is important. And then among independents, they have something in common with both. So this graph shows why immigration is uh, such a potent topic for the debate. Um, this is the widest difference that we've seen between Republicans and Democrats on illegal immigration as a very important goal. And again, twice as many Republicans as Democrats see immigrants and refugees coming into the United States as a critical threat. Climate change, same thing. Uh, this is actually the most uh, the, the widest gap between Republicans and Democrats, 58 versus 17. Okay, on, on, a, on the Iran nuclear deal, uh, polls conducted both before and after the deal was finalized show that Democrats are more supportive of the deal than Republicans. Um, there have been a lot of surveys conducted since then. Support has declined. We can talk about it later, but still that same trend applies. Democrats support the deal more than others. And it's only among Republicans that say that they would support the United States taking, um, sending U.S. troops to destroy Iran's nuclear facilities if Iran violates a nuclear deal. And then one other issue that separates Republicans and Democrats is um, Israel, which again, people tie the Iran deal to the security of Israel. Um, Republicans tend to think that Israel plays a positive role in resolving problems facing the Middle East, while Democrats tend to think Israel plays a negative role. However, there is still bipartisan goodwill toward Israel. It's on page 21, I believe, of the report, so you can check that out. Um, but Repu Democrats' more critical views of Israel may be related to the fact that they really think uh, a, an independent state for the Palestinians should be established on the West Bank and Gaza Strip. And this is a new um, shift for Democrats. You can see it was divided across the board in previous years, but now a majority of Democrats support a Palestinian state. And finally, to end on a point of consensus, it's on terrorism. Um, majorities, increasing majorities now say that international terrorism is a, a critical threat to the United States, and 55% uh, say that Islamic fundamentalism is a critical threat. That's a 15-point jump from last year, and it's actually at the highest level since our first poll conducted just after uh, September 11th. 
And this graph just shows that majorities across the board support a range of forceful actions against terrorism. So to conclude, Republicans and Democrats express equal support for remaining engaged in the world, but they have different preferences on how to address them. Currently, candidates are trying to reach their base voters on key foreign policy issues, and this is especially visible on immigration and on Iran right now. But once we move beyond the primaries, candidates will have to appeal to a, a broader public, and these results show that that will be a challenge given these deep divisions. and thank you as well to Evo and to the Chicago Council. Uh, we at Politico are delighted to be here today for this conversation and you know really the, this poll uh, stands out in a world of foreign policy to have something over 40 years time. Uh, you know I was always struck as editor of Foreign Policy magazine how little um, you know, engagement there was in the world of political polling with a really deep set of attitudes around the world, with the exception of this survey and the, the Pew International Survey, uh, for something that occupies so much of uh, any administration's time, increasingly Congress's time as well, you uh, see a, a striking absence of discourse at times. So this is incredibly well-timed because, of course, tonight will be the second presidential debate. And I think this, you know, does a, a pretty succinct job of capturing the moment in time that we're at in this uh, Republican race. Uh, it explains a lot of the uh, tougher than tough rhetoric you're hearing, uh, you know, as not only a surprise front runner in Donald Trump, but his issue immigration, you can see very clearly by the numbers there why that might be almost the single issue with which his candidacy is identified. Uh, you can see pretty striking evidence in these numbers of why this is not turning out to be Rand Paul's uh, year, so I think you know it. All in all, it makes a pretty strong and interesting case for you know this foreign policy moment we're in. And then my only other sort of big takeaway to start us off, right, is the incredible partisan divide that it really shows. Uh, you know, this to the extent anyone is still holding on to this old notion that uh, partisanship stops at the water's edge, uh, or that there is an American consensus, uh, that is just not reflected anymore uh, in the basic assumptions even that we have about the world, regions like the Middle East. There is no shared uh, American view uh, of that problem. There is no shared American view even of the facts when it comes to something like climate change or immigration for that matter. Uh, so tonight, uh, Michael uh, has just filed a story that's not yet appeared on Politico with a very intriguing premise, which is, what exactly does Donald Trump think about foreign policy? Uh, so maybe you can fill us in on uh, that. Does he have a worldview, and how is it reflected or not reflected uh, in those poll numbers? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thanks, all of you, and thanks for the great poll, uh, and uh, made it easy to write an interesting story because there's so many interesting numbers. It's a little bit of a reach to try to say that Trump has a foreign policy of vision because he's kind of all over the map, as you all know, if you've had a TV on for the last month. Um, but I do think on some fundamental level, Trump, and this is what my story gets at, um, he, he treats foreign policy as the art of the deal on the global stage. I mean, t for Trump, our interactions with countries around the world uh, are essentially negotiations. And he will drive a harder bargain and get a better deal, um, stick it to our enemies harder, and get more out of our friends. And there, there are, he actually, there are some interesting points embedded in that worldview. I mean, for instance, he argues that Saudi Arabia and, and South Korea are, are free riders, and Japan also, that they uh, enjoy the benefits of American security protection. They don't give enough, give enough back to us. His, um, you know, there are all kinds of problems we can find with the intervention in Libya, the follow through, uh, the aftermath of that. Trump's biggest complaint is that we should have extracted from the Libyans an agreement to give us 50% of their oil revenues for the next 25 years as a thank you for <laughs> toppling Muammar Gaddafi. Um, uh, so you go around the world, and of course, you know, I hardly need to mention his opinion of the Iran deal. Very convenient for him that the, the most burning foreign policy issue of the moment is about a negotiation, is about the art of the deal, and he claims this is the most incompetently negotiated deal he's ever seen in his life. This flows in part from, you know, one thing that I think is a, at least the semblance of an argument he can make when people say, how could you possibly have any qualification to be commander in chief? What do you know about the world? Um, 
his argument and uh, advisors to Trump have told me that you know, we'll be hearing more of this. Uh, you may or may not agree with it. I'm just going to lay it out. I'm not here to uh, promote Trump. Is look, I have uh, properties on five continents. I travel the world constantly. I meet with the top leaders in these countries. You know, compare it to Scott Walker. Uh, I don't know how long he's had a passport or how many trips he's made. I don't mean to denigrate him, but you know, he's been busy in Wisconsin. Trump was in Dubai last year. He was in Istanbul a couple years ago. He was in the Republic of Georgia speaking with Mikhail Saakashvili. Um, he has spent a lot of time with these people. Uh, I don't know how much he absorbs. I mean, the, the flip side, and I'll wrap up, is you know, we saw in his interview with Hugh Hewitt um, that he has these huge blind spots on fundamental questions like the difference between Hamas and, and Hezbollah. Uh, and so, he, so his worldview is very limited because it, it really has to do with this idea of how much money are we getting and what is our uh, payoff from things we do around the world that reminds him of his business deals. Um, but when it comes to really hard questions like uh, what do you do about Hezbollah and you know it has a military wing and a political wing, I mean he doesn't even un really seem to understand on that level. And what I will be interested to see tonight, and I'll say this in conclusion, is the degree to which candidates, for instance, like a Marco Rubio, who has, you know, has really sold himself as a foreign policy savant, went to the Council on Foreign Relations and talked about the security of shipping lanes in the South China Sea and these kind of esoteric uh, details. You know, does a guy like him smell blood in the water after the Hugh Hewitt interview and try to embarrass Trump, try to go after him and say, how can you possibly ensure, for instance, the security of Israel when you don't even know anything about their enemies? Uh, or is the feeling that everything we've seen about the Trump candidacy so far tells us that voters don't really care if he knows that stuff. And when he says he will delegate foreign policy to the best negotiators in the world, he said he'll put one negotiator for each country and they'll get all the best deals. Is that kind of what voters want to hear? So I'll be looking to see how that dynamic plays out tonight. So Evo, I've got to ask you, as both a practitioner uh, of uh, international diplomacy and now an observer of it, I is it dangerous to have presidential candidates who really don't know anything about the world? Is it dangerous to have Americans so deeply divided on, on core issues of principle when it comes to what our country should do in the world? Well, clearly, if you have a divided country, it is very difficult to have a united message to the rest of the world. Uh, and, you know, we're an open country. We have an open media. We, uh, uh, we broadcast our debates uh, on CNN and Fox and everything else all around the world. Uh, so there is a, and there's a thirst. Uh, I was just in Europe, uh, and uh, more people want to talk about Donald Trump there than they want to talk about him here, uh, if you can believe it. Uh, <laughs> in part because they, they, they want to say, is this real? And, and so we, 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 we are part of the global conversation. Uh, and if the global conversation shows these deep uh, schisms in, in how we deal with the world, um, the, the schism fundamentally between on the one hand, Republicans saying that if you're just tough, if you just stand your ground, those guys will just give in. And, 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 and Donald Trump is just another version of that same argument. That is, you can get a better deal by just being very tough. Versus the idea that actually a negotiation involves compromise. Yeah. It involves a give and take. And you try to get, you try to take as much and give as little. Uh, but in the end, in order to get an agreement, you have to understand the other side, and it's more complicated, et cetera, which is how Democrats look at it. And we just saw this play out on Iran. On, on Iran. The rest of the world thinks that the way it works is you try to get the best possible deal through compromise, which is why the rest of the world thought the Iran deal was uh, all in all a pretty good, uh, a pr a pretty good uh, uh, effort to, to deal with this problem, which is where, frankly, Democrats are. The Republicans aren't there. They're not there in this poll. They're on, on issue after issue. The belief is that being strong is sufficient to get, uh, to get what you want. Uh, and, and as a result, the, the, there is a, not only an interest, uh, I think there's a concern uh, that perhaps a, a leader will come forward uh, who doesn't really have an understanding of how the world works and will try to make uh, a particular point of view stick uh, in a way that is not likely to be beneficial to the interests of, uh, of, of those countries. Now, we don't elect presidents on the basis of what is good for that for other countries. We elect them on the basis of what's good for our own uh, country. So it is a debate that we will have. But part of that is how are we going to deal with the rest of the world? Well, it's interesting. Uh, 
historically, right, the conventional wisdom in sort of foreign policy circles here in Washington has been the less said about foreign policy on the campaign trail, the better, because candidates are only likely to say things that you know, are going to have to be walked back the second they get into the Oval Office. Uh, these guys don't seem to have that kind of a filter going on at the moment. No, I mean, they're clearly, they, uh, they, I think there is in the Republican, uh, among the Republican candidates, and frankly, I think in the Republican electorate, uh, a sense that the president uh, has been a weak foreign policy leader, uh, that as a result of that weakness, we have seen uh, the kind of chaos in the Middle East and in parts of Europe and in, in China, everybody probing left and right, uh, and that therefore the, re the recipe is pretty simple. Uh, have a strong leader, uh, and then everything will come, uh, will be all right. And uh, so it is okay to criticize the president. It's okay to uh, no longer let politics stop at the water's edge, but to take uh, your political criticism indeed abroad, which is what now is happening increasingly. Mm -hmm. It's okay, frankly, for, I guess, uh, for senators to write letters to the negotiating partner of the United States and tell them that whatever deal they agree with the Senate won't abide by. You're talking about a, a political story the other day about Senator Mitch McConnell. Uh, well, I was actually thinking of uh, the 47 senators mm -hmm. who sent oh, the letter, the to, letter. Uh, to, uh, to, to the leader of Iran. But mm -hmm. this, is, this is becoming quite, uh, uh, quite normal. Uh, and I think the, the rest of the world is becoming confused by that. Uh, and uh, it will make it more, it is already more difficult to conduct foreign policy, uh, as I think we see today, it will make it more difficult uh, no matter who's elected in, uh, in 2017 and beyond. Tina, I want to go back to the survey for a second. Tell us, give us some historical context, since you have 40 years worth of uh, these, these surveys, how much more divided are Americans on foreign policy right now uh, than they have been at times in the past? Um, well, the, the, there are about three key issues that show a widening of um, attitudes. One of them is on Israel. And it's more that Republicans have become more favorable in their views of Israel um, uh, over time, especially if you look at the thermometer chart. Um, and that Democrats have become more supportive of a Palestinian state over time. Um, there's a couple other issues like on immigration and on uh, immigration as a threat and immigration as a goal. You can see in the early years, Republicans and Democrats were really at the same place and independents. And then over time, it's actually Democrats became less concerned about those issues as perhaps because uh, immigration from Mexico was turning to net zero levels or because more Hispanics have become Democrats as well. But um, those are the other two and, and I want to ask about immigration because wh why is it then? What is the fact set, or you know, maybe the data don't don't show this, uh, that is causing Republicans' alarm to rise so much around immigration, given uh, that uh, immigration from Mexico, a traditional driver uh, of sentiment on this, uh, has has slowed down or is not perceived to be as big of an issue? Why on earth is it spiking? Is it related to anxiety about uh, you know outsiders and terrorism? What's what's going on with that? It's a mix. So actually, Republicans, they, they are at a high point, but uh, they've, they're actually still in line with some previous levels. Um, I think some of it has to do with concern about jobs. That's what our polls in 2013 show. They're worried about jobs. There's some kind of cultural fear. Speaking English is a big requirement for a lot of people for immigrants to come in. Um, so I think it's a combination of those two factors. And now immigration, well, last summer we had the migrant, our migrant crisis, which pales in comparison to what Europe's going through now. Mm -hmm. But um, that was an issue last year as well. And now there's a lot of talk during the debate and a lot more op-eds and discussion around it. And just like the Iran deal opinion, sort of gets more solid once people find out more about it. Right, there's that sort of chicken or the egg uh, thing going on, right? That a more polarizing issue creates a more polarized uh, view of that issue. Which I think is particularly true when it comes to Israel, actually. Those numbers really struck me. And, uh, you know, I think it, it comes from a lot of places, but the, the easiest way to think about it is the Netanyahu speech before the House, before Congress that was arranged through the House Republicans infuriated the White House. And I, w combined with the Iran deal, we've seen over the last six months or more this partisanship rising around Israel. And I think that has a self, 
fulfilling quality which drives the partisans into their corners. And uh, you know, I was actually quite surprised to see a, now a majority of Democrats see Israel as having a negative influence on the region. Um, that was a little more than I would have expected. But you know, unfortunately, you just it feels like there's a momentum where those numbers are headed in opposite directions, and the more it gets partisanized, the more each side doubles down. Uh, and you know, I think that um, that that is not. For instance, uh, APAC has a reputation. I think kind of in casual conversation as being a pro-Republican, sometimes people call it a neocon group. I, mean, I think APAC really does not like the idea of Israel being partisanized. They do not think that's a good thing for Israeli security. A lot of the experts who care about the US-Israel relationship think that's a very ominous trend. Uh, and I think President Obama is gonna try to reverse that to some extent now. Netanyahu will be coming to Washington in November and there's some talk of kind of some effort to kiss and make up, but it's gonna be uh, hard to pull that off. And it's not just on the American politician side. I mean, Netanyahu is, seems to be ever more closely aligned with the Republican Party, so that doesn't help. Certainly, Democrats would blame him for quite a lot of this. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Eva, what, what is your view uh, around the consequences of this partisanship in terms of actually making foreign policy? For example, there's a big takeaway here around a, a, a view of American engagement in the world, a view from Republicans, but not just Republicans, that somehow we should have a more muscular, if undefined, uh, response to the sort of serial crises in the Middle East. Uh, does that, doesn't necessarily translate, and clearly isn't going to translate into some kind of US campaign in Syria, for example. Uh, you know, what about that disconnect? Are Americans just happy to have a disconnect between their muscular rhetoric and their actual lack of action? Well, I think in, in part, I mean, it's, it's easier politically and for other reasons to, to have a muscular approach, particularly if you don't have to suffer the consequences of its implementation. Uh, and, and I think, you know, the, the, the congressional debate has become a microcosm of, in some ways, the foreign policy debate. It, it has become purely polarized. Remember what happened just on the Iran deal. Not a single Republican, mm -hmm. not one, That's right. supported the Iran deal. And the pressure put by the leadership in case of Senator Durbin in the Senate and, Senator, uh, and, and Representative Pelosi in, uh, in the House, plus the White House, on not getting as many votes, but getting rep Democratic votes, made, it, made this a highly partisan issue. Uh, and and you know, the strategy was probably the right strategy given where we were, but it's a sad commentary uh, on, on a very important security uh, issue that it has become so divided in a way that big issues like this didn't generally, weren't as divided. Yes, there were divisions on arms control and how to deal with the Russians uh, among Democrats and Republicans, in which Republicans were more skeptical and Democrats were less skeptical. But you had large bipartisan uh, uh, groups of people who, who, would, who were willing to go one way or the other, whether this was on big arms control votes or, or whatever. You never had this this essentially partisan uh, division. You have it on trade, mm -hmm. uh, as we saw. How difficult was it to get uh, even that handful of Democrats uh, to support presidential authority, and in fact their president's uh, authority to negotiate a trade agreement. So you have these deep partisan divisions that are in some ways paralyzing the way we conduct uh, 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 our foreign policy. I mean, just, just think about what would have happened if this deal had gone down. Mm -hmm. uh, the rest of the world would have basically said, you can't negotiate with the United States because whatever agreement you reach gets voted down when it hits Congress. We have that, by the way, on our trade negotiations right now. There are c countries that are not willing uh, to, to make the deals that are necessary uh, because they just don't think the United States will, uh, will abide by it. That's not good for our foreign policy and it's not good for our standing in the world. So I want to ask about the implications for Hillary Clinton uh, in these numbers. And we talked about Republicans and the Trump factor. You know, although one thing we haven't talked about is really the extent to which the Trump factor may have actually shut down a real foreign policy debate that looked like it was starting to happen. But let's table that for a second. Hillary Clinton, we haven't really mentioned her, except the clear implication is that, that people are not wild about President Obama's foreign policy record, uh, you know, sort of overall. It, it's, it's, at best a lukewarm picture 
that emerges by implication in these numbers. What else do you see uh, in this survey that suggests uh, what a former Secretary of State might face uh, in terms of the politics of her record uh, as Secretary of State? Let me start off, I mean, I think uh, I, she was Secretary of State of this administration, That's so right. it, she has uh, the duty, the need to embrace the, the core elements of, uh, of the administration. If you look at how she addressed the Iran issue, mm -hmm. uh, you can see how she's trying to, and, and, and the poll numbers sort of fit this very nicely, as the Secretary of State who was responsible for uh, for working with the president mm -hmm. and opening up the negotiations with Iran and strengthening the sanctions to get a deal, uh, she had to come out in, in support of a deal, which, by the way, is where the Democratic electorate is as well. But she has come out in supportive of the deal while embracing the majority view that, one, it's not likely that Iran is going to abide by this agreement, and two, if it doesn't, we need to take very significant action on the military front speech at the Brookings Institution a couple of days ago just underscored that that element of the public of the public's view of this deal has been uh, is where she is so you can argue that in one way or the other she's either following the public or she, the public is is basically in the position that she wants to be on this particular issue but on climate change she has been well out there where the republic where the democratic electorate is and not where the republican electorate is and if if a uh, Republican may well have a problem during a general election on the issue of immigration. Uh, this poll would emphasize that a Democrat may have a problem on the issue of climate change because of the deep partisan divisions on those issues. What do you think, Michael? Well, I, you know, I think that the, the political climate is filled with bad news and landmines for her. People are not happy with the state of the world. They generally don't think U.S. foreign policy has gone well, and there are a lot of particular issues you can criticize her for. But, you know, what, on some of the fundamentals that this poll shows, I actually think you could find uh, potential benefits for her. I mean, one is that people do think we should be engaged in the world and that there's a sense of, there's a sense of engagement and interest in what's happening around the world, maybe because of all the bad news, but it's nice to have been a Secretary of State and to have that experience under your belt, to have that fluency. Again, I understand it comes with a lot of uh, downsides and things she'll have to answer for that didn't go well, but she has met you know, virtually, if not every single significant foreign leader around the country, understands these countries really well. Hillary is also, you know, I think her DNA is, particularly relative to the Democratic Party, pretty hawkish. I mean, she, um, you know, I've written about this and thought a lot about it. I think that her formative years, when it came to foreign policy, she took uh, a real interest kind of in the mid to late 1990s. Her friend Madeleine Albright became Secretary of State. They spent a huge amount of time together. Albright is sort of a democratic hawk and interventionist. Uh, around this time, uh, the Clinton administration intervened in, in Kosovo and the Balkans. Uh, and I think she developed a real interventionist hawkish instinct. And in fact, if you look at her record in Obama's cabinet in that first term, I think you can make the case she was actually the most hawkish member. She was more hawkish than Robert Gates. She was right there alongside the generals. Uh, when Stan McChrystal wanted to surge big in Afghanistan, she was lockstep with him. She wanted to go into Libya. What the poll shows is that the public actually has a relatively high appetite for flexing American military muscle. You see it much more on the Republican side, but you do see it uh, on the Democratic side. It's surprised in some cases uh, how much you saw that. Uh, so, so I think she will not be playing up the hawkishness now in a Democratic Party, uh, in a Democratic primary, but particularly when she gets to a general election and Republicans try to get to her right, again, she'll be fending them off on Benghazi and all kinds of things. Uh, she will be able to point to a bunch of cases where uh, she can say, hey, I am completely comfortable with the use of American force. I am totally ready for the job of commander in chief. Whatever kind of stupid gender stereotypes might still be out there about a woman in force, they don't apply to me. So I think you know it's a mixed bag, but, it, but th that's at least the glass half full version uh, based on the numbers here. Susie, can I just add something? Because I actually don't read the poll numbers as Americans being that much more muscular, yes, in terms of a direct threat, which mm -hmm. is ISIS and terrorism. but. In general, actually, Americans pretty much were, uh, uh, what Obama's foreign policy guidelines were, stay out of wars, yep. use drones and airstrikes, try for dialogue. That's really in line with what the 
overall public wants. They, now in implementation, it might not have come out so well, but I do think that in general, we shouldn't overestimate how involved Americans want to get in entanglements overseas. I think there's a really that's important true. point. It's more like the, basically they want muscular talk, uh, but any specific yeah. uh, intervention or policy prescription, uh, it's not clear that they want it, and in many cases they actively don't want it. Uh, right. But of course you can see where that's a recipe also for I would argue some of the dissatisfaction that has followed Obama's foreign policy consistently from the beginning of his tenure, which is to say uh, he doesn't give them a lot of the bluster that they actually do like, the sort of America first chest beating, the exceptionalism. Remember, that was a whole theme of the 2012 campaign. So he frustrates them on the rhetorical front. Uh, and then, you know, it's kind of a contradictory position, basically, that your survey is suggesting and that we all know sort of inherently to be true. We like the image of ourselves as a sort of do-gooding superpower uh, without really, it's, it's very clear, for example, in Syria uh, that uh, the president's position, while maddening uh, at times, especially as you look at the pictures of refugees and such, in, in fact does reflect on uh, America that would be very, very unwilling uh, to actively oppose to doing much more. Um, well, and one of the things, like, if your achievement is not getting involved in a war, it's sort of hard to get credit for something that you weren't actually doing. One thing, and I do want to get to the audience question soon, so please uh, have some questions uh, in mind, but go ahead, Mike. Well, I was just going to say that I, I agree, and I don't think that she's going to be promising more interventions like Libya. Uh, it's probably not going to be a big selling point for her, but I think it adds up to a kind of image of toughness. Mm -hmm. And by the way, she also has the diplomatic card. So you know, you, we're, we're seeing this mix of people wanting diplomacy. Uh, in certain cases, they're wanting toughness. I just think that th she's got some of both, and if she plays it right, she can kind of she can she can finesse it and make a strong argument. Uh, but it's not going to be easy. So one thing uh, that struck me was your list of top threats. Uh, it is a very scary, you could say it's almost a Dick Cheney-like world uh, that Americans describe when you ask them, uh, what are these threats? I mean, it's Islamic terrorism, it's uh, cyber terrorism, it's, it's, it's a pretty dark world of, of threats out there. One thing, climate change, at least for Democrats, um, there was no Russia, there was no Vladimir Putin, although if you ask Americans in other surveys I've seen who's sort of the bad guy, uh, he's consistently number one or number two. What'd you make of that, Evo, in Europe that he would rate higher, I would say? I, I think it's in part a reflection of what, our, what we're consuming on TV and in the news. I mean, we are only talking about ISIS, and, and certainly in the last sort of since, since the beheadings uh, of last summer, which is why I think you see the spike of 15 points in the, in the fear of terrorism uh, and fear of radical uh, Islam, Islamic attack coming to the United States. It's now the highest threat uh, by, uh, in, in, in a bipartisan way. Uh, so the things we talk about is, and we talk about cyber attacks, and there's been plenty of news about, uh, uh, about cyber problems, and we don't spend a lot of time talking about Putin. Now, I think if you do the poll today, given what's happening with uh, what Putin is doing in Syria, you may, you may get a higher uh, number. I mean, in some ways, uh, I'm an old, old school international relations uh, 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 person. You'd think that the rise of China would be kind of big on, and, and high on that list uh, uh, from uh, threats. It's, it's nowhere. Uh, and when you, in fact, ask about China as a threat, the threat is seen as an economic term, certainly not in military terms. Um, uh, so I think it reflects a, a very narrow kind of debate that we're having about, about the world that has, to be, that has been dominated by ISIS, Syria, Iraq, uh, and Iran to some extent, uh, and, and cyber. Uh, and then, uh, then other stuff starts pointing through. So water scarcity all of a sudden becomes an issue for Democrats, which is interesting. And, and I think if you look at the world, you ought to be afraid about water scarcity, climate change, immigration. So there are patterns that go beyond that. But I think uh, in part because we haven't focused as much in, on, on Russia and, and what's happening there or in China that those kinds of issues just don't make it to the fore. Tina, do you have any other thoughts based on sifting through this data around this uh, spike? The coverage of the beheadings was actually quite a while ago uh, by the time you took this survey. Uh, what do you think is going on with uh, this anxiety around uh, an ISIS attack here 
in the United States. Um, obviously, September 11th was of a, an order of magnitude vastly different uh, than what you've seen in terms of American uh, connection with what's happening in Iraq and Syria with, with ISIL. And yet, these levels of concern are just through the roof. Yeah, well, they're not through the roof. They're not as high as they were right after September 11th. So right, but well, I'm saying that's so much of right. a bigger but, um, moment. But again, I think it's the media coverage. It's uh, the beheadings, the beheadings of Americans and other Europeans, and the Charlie Hebdo attacks. And um, it's been a constant stream of reminders. And so some of that might have awakened some of the trauma from the September 11th attacks. But I think it's interesting that Americans make a distinction between this, um, Islamic fundamentalism and terrorism. Um, there's a big difference in the magnitude of, that they see each of those, which is actually a l level of sophistication. Um, By the way, I wonder if Americans feel that you, after 9-11, we were focused on these catastrophic, catastrophic events threatening New York and Washington, maybe Los Angeles. Now you hear the FBI director or Homeland Security director saying, you know, we're tracking uh, ISIS sympathizers potentially in all 50 states, mm -hmm. and there's a shooting in, I guess it was Knoxville, that looks like it may have been influenced. And I think there's a sense of, I'm going to go to the mall pushing my stroller, and one of these guys is going to pop up. There, that definitely existed after 9-11, but I, you know, my just kind of gut sense here is that that might be uh, a stronger uh, feeling now, and that that could be driving it. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, it's interesting if you think about it in the context of immigration and the sort of fear of the other, which is mm -hmm. a persistent theme, of course, in, in American politics as well. Uh, well, I want to turn to the audience right now uh, and get your questions in uh, to people. Please, I think we have a microphone here. Uh, when you ask a question, tell us who you are, uh, where you're from, and do make it a question. We can go ahead and start with you, ma'am. Hi there. Thank you so much for this discussion. I'm Mary Kay Costello with The Hunger Project. Um, and in obviously biased since I'm in the development sector and a lot of my work relates to development in the global south, um, but I'm thinking about these particular focus areas as it relates to Democrats and Republicans and in the macro discussion it makes a lot of sense in the context of presidential debates for their next four possibly eight year terms, but that's also very short term. Um, the reality of this is that it's thinking about what we can do to be reactive as far as terrorism is concerned or be reactive on immigrants is very short term. And the long term fact of the matter is that we need to be addressing opinions of Americans on foreign policy as it concerns actual long term development initiatives. And this means strengthening good governance at local levels, food security issues, and even IFPRI's recent um, global nutrition report which says that for every dollar invested in nutrition get $16 back. That literally would outbreak our stock market. Um, these things would make a huge preemptive effect long term on not even needing to rely exclusively on immigration policies or trying to reactively handle terrorism. So where does this fit in the discussion and is it possible that this might be something we look into um, as far as the opinions between the Republicans and the Democrats are concerned? Because if we're only thinking about the symptoms, we're not thinking about the causes. Well, my guess is we're not going to hear a lot about it tonight in the, the debate. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Do, do you want to? Uh, I mean, there are there are American attitudes on these issues, and, and we do and when we do look at them uh, in the long term. I, I would just say, just to start off, uh, climate change and the view, and the views on climate change. Both we emphasize here the partisan differences, but if you look at the overall view, I mean, that is one of those issues that needs to be dealt with preemptively. Uh, and there is a, uh, it's a minority still, but it's a large minority that is willing to take significant steps, including incurring significant costs in the short term to deal with that particular issue in, in, in the long term. And basically, Americans are always favorably um, inclined toward any type of humanitarian issue that, that we can help with. But, um, that it I may have misunderstood your question. Is it sounded like you were you had more of a domestic focus in mind, and no, no, no. no? Then I misunderstood the question. So I'm but, sorry. But, I mean, to your point, I think you know, particularly on the Republican side in this climate, there's just not a lot of interest in you know anything that sounds like foreign aid and sending our money. I mean, this is to kind of go back to what I said about Trump at the outset. The tone that Trump is setting now is. 
you know, we're sending money all over the world, we're protecting everybody, nobody's giving us anything in return, it's crazy. And the, the question is how contagious will that be? Uh, it's always been a pretty powerful message and when you have someone who articulates it, even if you completely disagree with him, I think he articulates it in a way that's persuasive to a lot of Americans. Um, unfortunately, I think that's terrible for your cause. And so I wish I could tell you something more encouraging. And on the Democratic side, um, the one thing I'll say is, you know, Hillary Clinton does, I think, think about, she wants to think about issues this way. She cares a lot about this sort of thing. She cares about development. Um, but it's going to be hard for her to get that message out, assuming she's the nominee, uh, particularly if she's up against that kind of sentiment. So I don't know what to tell you that's encouraging. Uh, Trump is bad news for, for on that front, unfortunately. And, and climate change, those attitudes are really related to whether people think climate change exists or not. So one of the reasons Democrats are more in support of it among the public is because they think it's an immediate issue and needs immediate steps to limit it. But Republicans are more divided between those who think, uh, who question whether it really exists and those who think it can be addressed through gradual, not immediate steps. So that's a big factor there. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I had a question here in the front and then we'll go to this, Kevin. Hi, thank you, Kevin Barron, I'm executive editor of Defense One. Uh, so, a, a couple of thoughts. I wanted to know, um, what does your data show about the difference between American opinions versus their qualifications to have these opinions on foreign policy issues? So, to get to Evo's point of, you know, why do white people don't care as much about China as a threat versus climate? You know, well, everyone has to recycle in their yard, but not too many people know about Chinese politics um, or threats. And, and especially the idea of military intervention as a solution for all these threats and problems that everyone is ranking. I mean, today we're hearing John McCain on the Hill with General Austin talking about ISIS, and it's still just a debate about all or nothing, right? And, and not much else in between in the middle. And that kind of nuance gets lost. The final thing I'll ask, and maybe Mike, hear, hear your thoughts on this, is how much any of this matters to the electorate? I mean, we're talking about tonight and the, and the campaign, and we can talk about all these issues, but compared to jobs and economy and education, like every national election, I'm, I'm extremely skeptical that anything that has to do with our world, global security, foreign policy world, will have any play whatsoever come next November when people just go pull that, pull that lever and the country is still a 48 to 48 divided country and whether or not, you know, ISIS or and maybe all of this amounts to some sort of you know, lean toward hawkishness or not or stronger or not as strong depending on, you know, the waves of the, of the year. What, what, can, what can the data of today tell us about that big picture question? A lot of good questions there. Uh, you know, let's, uh, Let's start with the last one while you're uh, looking at the first, uh, which is the sure. does it matter question. So, I, you know, Kevin, I guess that's hard to say. Uh, I would say that clearly these issues, as we've seen, have been elevated uh, to a new level because of ISIS, because of the beheadings, because of that emotional. I really think the visual power, you know, if those, even if the beheadings had occurred but not been uh, unfortunately there for us to see on the internet, I think we, it would be a different ball game. But you know, you see the numbers. Uh, people, people saying what they think the top. The people saying they think jobs are the top national security concern versus terrorism. They're they're side by side. Will it matter on election day? I would just point back, uh, for instance, to the 2004 election, where I think there was a lot of evidence that security really, at the end of the day, tilted things in favor of George W. Bush. It's kind of amazing in some ways because Iraq was going totally off the rails at that point. Uh, but John Kerry failed to, this goes back to what I was saying about Hillary Clinton, uh, and, and in my opinion, I think has done a pretty good job of being able to present herself as sort of a quote unquote strong figure in crude political focus group terms. Uh, Kerry, I don't think really pulled that off, and I think voters at the end of the day felt like, if nothing else, Bush will keep us safe. Um, and you know, a lot of people think that, uh, if you might recall, uh, there was a Bin Laden recording that came out like the Friday before the election, and I know a lot of people who work for Kerry think that that was potentially decisive, moved just enough votes in Ohio uh, to kill it for him. So I don't discount the possibility, I guess it's a long way of saying, I don't discount the possibility that um, it will make a difference, but uh, there's a lot of water to pass under the bridge, so what will the economy do between now and then? What will the stock market do between now and then? And will we see more uh, gruesome murders of Americans on YouTube? Let's pray not, but I think it's, uh, I, can, I can give you an answer now, but it will depend so much on those factors. Well, and a quick note before we get to your other questions. This survey doesn't, but many surveys have look, consistently look at what are the issues that rank, mm -hmm. and there's been a jump 
uh, in that national security number, which uh, for a long time was not even in, uh, certainly not the top five, sometimes not in the top 10, uh, it now is. Uh, and it has been really for the last year, I think, uh, since, since ISIS really came onto the American consciousness, uh, whether it will still be there in November 2016, we don't know, number one. And of course, uh, we do know from a long sweep of history and polling data that uh, if the economy is not in good shape, then it really doesn't matter if right. uh, national security is number four or number seven, uh, because it's not going to be decisive. Um, right. But your point on uh, Kevin's other questions. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, so on uh, why should we listen to Americans? Uh, I have been really struck. Exactly <laughs> <laughs> he basically are they, said, are they, are they qualified, qualified to, to make the judgments that they have? <laughs> it was yeah. kind of a My short question. hand was, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, I've been struck. I used to work on opinion abroad. And um, I've been really struck since coming to this job, actually, how pragmatic and logical and consistent American public opinion is on these issues. I mean, when you go through our report, you'll see um, it's not volatile. It does make sense. It sometimes responds to events, but it all makes sense. And then we also did a survey of elites in 2014. That was opinion leaders like um, uh, business leaders and academics and think tanks and, and media types. And their opinions were not really that much different than the public on a lot of issues. Um, so they may be better informed. They may be better um, aware of where these places are. But in terms of overall values, in terms of foreign policy, there is a real connection between the two. And then just in terms of interventions, actually, Bruce Jenelson's in the office. He's written a lot about interventions in the prudent public. And Americans. Uh, have kind of a catalog of when they, not always, but you can generally assume that if Americans sense a direct threat, so terrorism is one, for Republicans, Iran nuclear program is one, then they will support an intervention. But if it's something that's considered not a direct threat to the United States, like the crisis in Syria, the, the war in Syria, like Ukraine, then they don't want to get involved. Also, if a formidable military power like China or Russia would be the pro, you know, the antagonist in that. Um, Americans also don't want to get involved because it would be significant cost. So if it's something that can be dealt with with airstrikes or assassinations, Americans can su will support it sometimes if they sense a direct threat. Is All right, it? I want to get to people in the back because you've been so patient, you sir. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm John Glenn with the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition. It's been a great discussion. I'd like to ask a little bit if you could tell us your sense about where you talk about the approaches to foreign policy. It's striking how much of it focuses on alliances, building them, maintaining them. And this is, in fact, one of the sort of points which you hear in the political debate. I'll restore alliances or something. But maybe Evo, as our former ambassador to NATO, I'd be interested in your sense. What do you think Americans mean or think of when they talk about the importance of alliances in advancing our foreign policy? So I think they're thinking about two things, and you see it in the survey. One is they, they want to work together with countries that are kind of like us. So the Euro European Union and Japan, democracies that we've dealt with for a long time, they are very comfortable working with. Um, and the second thing, they look at alliances as burden share. I mean, alliances are fundamentally about others helping us to do what we want to do. Uh, now, you know, we've not always been successful in getting our allies to share the burden, but that is, that is really fundamentally uh, uh, but, uh, what they're trying to get at. If, if we can get countries that are kind of like us to work with us and frankly do more, then we don't have to do as much. Uh, and, and I think that is the attractiveness of this alliance. So there's a value base and there's, a, and there's an interest based, uh, and, and in that sense a very logical way. And I think I think you know, Donald Trump, when he goes around and says, we're spending all this money, we're not getting anything back, there is this sense of this free rider problem, of these countries that uh, you know, have, have, have had great security, been able to economically prosper because we took care of their security, and now it's their time. Uh, so I think there is a resonance 
uh, with that as well. And particularly when you have an economic downturn, our willingness to, to not only, we're willing to lead as long as people do what we tell them to do, uh, but then we also want them to pay for it. All right, we probably have time for one or two more questions. Uh, Ma'am, right here. Thank you, Beth Hallowell, American Friends Service Committee. I'm um, looking forward to reading the full survey report, but I was wondering if we could go back to the, one of the final comments that Dina made during the panel discussion. Um, if, and forgive me if I get this wrong or misunderstood, but um, you mentioned that you were surprised or struck by how survey respondents were able to distinguish between, I believe it was Islamism and terrorism or Islamic extremism and terrorism. And um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. We're in the middle of an analysis of our own, we do media research on, uh, right now we're in the analysis phase of a study on uh, media coverage of these issues and I've been struck by, by the opposite, the lack of distinguishing. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that response. Yeah, let me see if I can quickly find, uh, start that. Um, so I don't, this is something we need to investigate further. I don't actually have, I only have my own speculation, but 55% uh, of Americans fear, uh, say that Islamic fundamentalism is a critical threat, which has been a big jump, and then 69% say that international terrorism is a threat. Um, and I think some Americans, can make the distinction of Islamic fundamentalism being like Orthodox Judaism or Christian fundamentalism. Some may not. And there is some interaction between the two variables, but it's a pretty big difference between the two. So that was my point. Yeah, thank you. Right there. Thank you. Thank you all for the survey. Uh, great public service. Um, Daryl Kimball with the Arms Control Association, and I wanted to, Dina, come back to the Iran uh, nuclear deal uh, survey results. Given how uh, divided the Congress has been, it seems to me that the, uh, the survey data shows a remarkable amount of support, uh, even among Republicans, for the agreement. Um, and I noticed that in the survey question, you described a little bit about what the deal does. So as a pollster, could you just explain why you think those results came out with this question versus some of the other national polling results that are a little different. Um, it was a complicated agreement, and, and as somebody who's worked on this, I know that the more information you have, uh, the more you understood the question. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so quickly, our result is from uh, before the agreement was finalized, and there, there was some media attention, but not a lot, and actually politicians hadn't come out taking stands yet. So th that's actually a great example of how events and the news and discussion can affect opinion. Um, ours was 59% support. Today there was a Washington Post ABC News poll mm -hmm. that came out and found if you just asked, do you support or oppose the agreement without any description, it's divided. But if you, 45% versus 44, I believe, opposing. But if you ask them the same question with a description of what the agreement entails, it's 51% support versus 41% support. That's still not as high as it has been, but polls have shown and people have been experimenting. And it shows that the more information people have, at least in the question, the more likely they are to support it. But polls have shown support to be as low as 21%. Pew found that result with a larger number now saying they don't know. Thank you so much. I know we're just about out of time, so I want to give everybody a, a final lightning round uh, to uh, give us a prediction about uh, what foreign policy issues will come up uh, in tonight's debate. Uh, and just to thank you, all of you for sharing your lunch hour with us today uh, as well. All right, Michael, I'm putting you on the spot. What do you think? <laughs> China, 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 uh, and uh, and I think Iran, Iran, and, and Trump will talk about China, Iran, and uh, and and I said and and Rush, I think that we'll hear people pouncing on Putin, uh, Putin's new intervention in Syria. This is another humiliation for President Obama. America has no leadership in the Middle East. Actually, that will be the fresh topic. I'll be interested to hear how people talk about it. And those were not my own words. Those were words I am imagining to hear the uh, the Republicans say on the stage tonight. I should clarify. Yeah, I think the common theme is going to be uh, we have a weak president, we need a strong leader, and it doesn't matter what the issue is, that's going to be the answer. So Obama will be up there on that stage. Ob Obama will be there as the, as the, the, uh, as the, uh, the punching bag. 
uh, and no matter what the foreign policy issue is, he's the problem and I am the solution. Dina, we're probably not going to hear about climate change, but uh, other than no, that, no. what do you think? Uh, I, I think what Michael and Evo said, and perhaps somehow blaming the migration crisis that were on the same, same general factors. Well, thank you to all of you uh, and to our great uh, audience. These were terrific questions. And uh, you can read more uh, on Politico and on the Chicago Council's website. And thanks again for coming. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everybody.